Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all the conference delegates uh, and to the speakers taking part in this morning's plenary session uh, of uh, the second National Higher Education Conference. The theme of the session today is a reimagining university engagement within the context of a responsive, responsible, and transformative university. Discussion on this theme has already started uh, in the previous conference sessions uh, and the link between transformation and engagement um, has already been foregrounded. The Council on Higher Education uh, seeks to contribute to growing a quality higher education sector in South Africa that is responsive, that is responsible, and okay. that is transformed. Such a system is seen to consist of a differentiated networked set of engaged institutions that are grounded in context from the local to the global and of which are responsive to the needs and challenges prevalent in the contextual ecosystem in which that system exists. Very importantly, and fundamentally through their knowledge projects. From this perspective then, transformation is about unbecoming what we are in order to become what we want and need to be. A higher education system that is indeed engaged, responsive and responsible. Today's session will involve inputs from three speakers. Um, and we will have some time after they have provided their uh, insights to engage with the ideas that they've put forward. Um, and so we invite you to reflect any questions uh, and comments on the chat so that we can pick those up uh, in a short discussion session at the end. With those few introductory remarks, allow me to introduce uh, Professor Temba Mosia who will provide the opening remarks and introduce the session. Professor Mosia and all the other speakers' biographies can be found on the conference website. Uh, Professor Mosia has been involved in higher education for much of his professional career and has worked at multiple levels of the system and in multiple roles and so brings a wealth of knowledge and experience into the discussion. He is currently the Vice Principal for Student Life at the University of Pretoria and is also the Chairperson of the Council on Higher Education, to which he provides a really astute leadership. Uh, Professor Mosia, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Uh, greetings, colleagues, distinguished guests, and everyone. Um, I, I think this is, is one of those. Uh, uh, seminal moments for us in higher education, especially during these difficult times. And, and of course, our collaboration with, uh, with both the, the use of uh, and the department is, is much appreciated so that we can be able to, to actually get into this melting pot and come up with uh, uh, ideas that can advance our agenda of reimagining university engagement uh, within this context of uh, being responsive, responsive, being responsible, and of course, uh, transforming ourselves as universities. Um, I mean, th this is one of those things that, uh, I mean, we know that uh, we have the core mandates, you know, teaching and learning and research are very well developed, go back a long way. And, and our focus here, which is really our interest in the CHG in this conference, is on community engagement. And, and because, you know, there are multiple interpretations that you find uh, on this across the sector. Some call it engaged scholarship, others call it uh, just engagement, others call it service learning. So it's, it's, you know, it's not as coordinated, although we understand what it is that we mean. And of course, uh, we also know that uh, our funding framework uh, 
foregrounds teaching and learning and research, and uh, not much around uh, uh, committee engagement. And these are some of the observations that, that we have as a sector. So the two mandates are very well developed, and the third one, you know, it's okay. We'll see what we can do about it. And if you look at uh, <clears throat> the writings of Bender in 2008, he, he actually mentions this as well, that uh, uh, despite the policy initiatives that we have in place, you know, that encourage us to mainstream uh, community engagement into our business or our core business to advance transformation and social responsibility, uh, it, it is, of course, a fact that uh, this is regarded as a mere add-on or just a nice to have or a philanthropic activity you know, in many of the, of the institutions across the sector. So, and it is on that basis that I think we need to apply our mind. There, there is resistance, we know that, uh, in accepting community engagement as one of the core mandates of universities. And I'm not suggesting in any way that uh, there is nothing happening uh, around community engagement. We know that there are pockets of excellence everywhere you look, but uh, we need to probably uh, look at this much, much more deeper and how we can be able to, to coordinate it in a manner that uh, can make an impact in our society. So we, we really need to extend ourselves beyond our internal community. And, and look out uh, in a much more vigorous way. Now, this is our core mandate, we know that. And uh, of course, we, we disseminate knowledge and, and the transfer of technology. We do all kinds of things. And, um, and, and I think uh, colleagues, one of the things that we need to embrace, you know, uh, is that we, we know that we produce graduates, you know, uh, with a sense of civic responsibility. And we know what the white paper said about the socialization of enlightenment and responsible and constructively critical citizens. What I call the bourgeois bohemian, you know, the bogus, you know, you have that kind of a blended, uh, you know, outlook. And, and this perspective places universities, of course, at the center of uh, uh, supporting a democratic ethos, um, and, and culture of, of human rights and, and commitment to humane and non-racial and non-sexist order. There are also some universities, you know, <clears throat> uh, that view this you know, as a mechanism for bridging the gap between the theory and practice and, and, and between knowledge production and knowledge transfer and application. This perspective emphasized the application of uh, theory developed from various disciplines within universities to local development issues. And this perspective on community engagement is popular in Africa and many developing countries where universities are funded by government as part of their national and social development budgets. But this government wish to actually have these active roles and, and stimulation and facilitation of the economic uh, or socioeconomic development in their regions. And, and, and in our case, of course, and many others, you know, it is advancing the realization of our sustainable development goals as a way of justifying and taking up a significant portion of, uh, of our national budgets which we do, although, of course, it's never enough. Now, perspectives on this, uh, you know, committee engagement as we have it, engaged scholarship, service learning, as we call it in other settings, you know, are, are pretty much, you know, something in common around transforming our universities so that we are not less engaged as ivory towers as other scholars or we call ourselves by the manner in which we, we behave as institutions, removed from our communities, or resisting community engagement as, as uh, what could anchor us 
And, and I think this is what should make us relevant. Um, and we are all in agreement about that, even some of the conversations we had yesterday. We are not uh, contradicting one another. Because we're anchored in these communities and societies. And, and we're expected to advance transformation and strengthen our democratic values and, and developing responsible and compassionate citizens. Uh, if we look at the work of uh, Jacob, Sutin, uh, Weidman, and Yeager, um, their observations about mutual relationship between universities and communities. And, um, and this should help us you know, understand how we provide our human resources, because really it's, it's not just about money, about funding. There are so many things that you can do just engaging in your communities without uh, spending a lot of money. And I think it is that spirit of volunteerism that is quite essential for us to actually plow back into these communities. Um, we know that, uh, I mean, we are constrained, we have multiple challenges and, and, and we just simply not coping. Um, but we have to push on to become responsible, responsive and responsible and transform this society. No one else will do it for us and, and through our engagement. We need to invest, you know, in the scholarship and practice of community engagement colleagues. Uh, I mean, if, if we look at uh, how advanced the two core mandates are, you know, teaching and research, it goes a long way. It takes long time to be number one. You can't simply just be there, you know, and which is what concerns me quite a lot as a, as, as a person that works in the system. We compete too much and we collaborate less. Of course, we collaborate quite a bit in research because it's so well developed and we all want to be number one. And is it necessary really? Others would say yes, but it can't be. It's a simple disorder. I'm more concerned about the struggling uh, communities you know, or, or, or universities within communities that are struggling more than others. And we see that uh, rankings, of course, are the in thing, they matter. And um, one ranking was introduced you know, a few weeks ago about the student experience and you know, which one is number one and all of that. I'm not pretty much bothered about that. Um, I'm more bothered about students whose experiences are not what they should be like others. And if some European or American introduce a ranking around committee engagement, you will see how we'll rush and take it seriously. So it is one of those things that we need to really ask ourselves. Um, can we meaningfully integrate committee engagement into, into our teaching and learning and research activities in a manner that impacts on our society, not just pay lip service to? And, and of course, perhaps we should look at the tangible outcomes of this um, a conference and see how our deliberations, you know, around this topic uh, could be able to guide us and have good practice that we can all take seriously and all be on the same page. Um, because of the constraint of time, colleagues, those of you who know me well now can speak forever, but uh, I actually cannot do that now. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to the conversations that uh, Prof. Pindile Lukele Onorunju and uh, Professor Salim uh, Vali will share with us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Masia, for those insightful comments that do indeed set the scene for our speakers. Um, I think the comments about rankings uh, and kind of trying to measure up uh, to these uh, sexy um, uh, processes uh, in the system without really paying attention, attention to meaningful uh, participation, meaningful engagement um, uh, is really an issue that we have to uh, uh, engage more on. Uh, let me introduce our next speaker uh, for today's session, um, who is uh, Professor Pindile Lukele Olaranju. Professor Pindile's biography 
indicates quite interestingly that her career has taken her from the fields to the labs, to the teaching spaces, to the boardrooms, um, and not necessarily in a linear fashion. Uh, indeed, a very interesting journey. Prof. Lukele Olaranju has a background in agricultural sciences and has held researcher, academic, and administrative positions uh, in this field. Um, she is currently the Director for Research Management uh, at the University of Mpumalanga. Professor Olarunju, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I would like to say thank you to the organizers of this conference for giving me the opportunity to share on reimagining university engagement within the context of a responsive, responsible, and transformative university. I will now present my topic on this, starting with um, the next slide. Now, our discussion this morning will follow the above structure. We will start with a brief introduction and then follow up with the concept in the topic of discussion, university engagement in the context of a responsive, responsible, and transformative university. It should also be noted that the discussion of this concept are not set in stone and have been subject to much debate over the years. I think you will agree with me that reimagining anything, or in this case, university engagement, speaks to applying a new perspective to something that already exists. It does not mean that what is taking place now is not working, but how do we make it better? How do we reimagine it? It challenges the common saying that, that is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We are fixing it. An obvious but perfect example is how the Department of Higher Education and Training has been focusing on reimagining or reinventing universities through stakeholder engagements, such as the summits we had in 2010, in 2015, and the conference in 2019, which was hosted by USAF, and the title was Reinventing South Africa's Universities for the Future, for the Future. And this was in Pretoria in 2019. Through these engagements, we see reimagination when stakeholders discuss the positives and negatives of the current higher education framework individuals have opportunity to assess whether established processes in universities need to be changed or need imagination or reimagining. Of these have been great efforts to encourage universities to add value to what they are already engaged. Now to place things in context, we need to look at the mandate of the university which is teaching and learning, research and engagement. Most universities have been responsive and responsible enough to know that engagement encompasses different communities or stakeholders and not just the village next door. Engagement is with communities and that includes societies, scholarship, student and staff communities, both local, national, regional, continental, and global. Currently, some universities just restrict this engagement to village or local communities around the university. I know this from some of the interviews of academics that I attend. Now, the reimagined situation is where we all understand who or what engagement covers. For a university to engage effectively with communities, it must be responsive, responsible, and transformed. What is a responsive university? 
to what must universities respond to? Similar questions will be asked on the concept of responsibility and transformation of university. We ask the question responsible to whom and why? And transformative in what way and why? Do we have such universities in South Africa? We can describe a responsive university as one that reacts positively to a need from its stakeholders. The question is who are university stakeholders and what are the needs we are referring to? This is how we refer to engagement with different communities or stakeholders. And this encompass students, staff, civil society, private, public sector, government, both national and international. We are not just talking about community as community, the village next door. An explanation discussed further by Wood in 2015 about what makes a university responsible gave a list of what might be considered as stakeholders. He listed these as funders, that is politicians and taxpayers and parents for public institutions. Number two, donors for private universities. But we all know that even public universities have donors. The next one he listed were students, were staff, governing councils and communities where universities have influence and can set examples from the knowledge they developed. All South African universities have many, if not all of the above as stakeholders. They have national and international partners with whom they develop and share knowledge. As we know that the 2001 National Plan for Education emphasizes responsiveness to regional and national needs. A reimagined situation would mean that as needs arise in communities, a university begins to respond to those needs. For example, the following development needs are identified by the sector or stakeholders. I will list them for now as we will discuss them at length later. These include technological advances, current challenges, sustainability of universities, decolonization of universities, engagement with communities, student employability and skilling, national challenges, which includes inequality strikes, and how do all these relate to engagement? The list is an ending. And note that most of these were mentioned in the 2019 New South Conference recommendations. We will expand on these when we discuss a responsible university. Universities know that they have to fulfill their mandate. We live in critical times where beneficial knowledge must be shared timelessly with stakeholders. Though not controlled by stakeholders, universities must be accountable to their stakeholders by being responsive. If there is no accountability, universities operate outside their mandate and cause unnecessary confusion. However, if their stakeholders control them, then they cease to be universities. Now let us talk about a responsible university. It is one that acts for the benefit of its stakeholders and is morally accountable to its actions. In South Africa, universities are funded by the state and therefore obliged to act responsibly. They must implement the higher education goals and objectives as per the Higher Education Act 101 of 1997. Ford in 2013 lists seven features of a responsible university. I will mention just two. He says a responsible university promotes 
all round education. That is unite knowledge and understanding with imagination, good judgment and decision making in life and at work. It also contributes to society, producing responsible graduates, innovations and outputs that influence public policy and many other ways of giving back to society. Responsibility of universities also ties into the vision, mission, and values of the institutions. At the core of these values is an inherent responsibility to see the betterment of society. The human beings in a university matter. Their values count. We will expand more on this particular slide because we need to understand what the needs are and under the responsive university. Now, reimagining engagement in a responsive and responsible manner is further seen in examples of universities meeting the following development needs. We mentioned this earlier, but now we'll just talk a little bit more on them. The first one is technological advances. At the 2019 conference, Prof. Mawala touched on what technological development in the 4IR means for the workplace and for the universities. Little did he know that in five months, due to COVID-19, workplaces and universities would be forced to develop and also implement some of these technologies to support stakeholders. Universities started making serious use of their techno scientists, techno social scientists, and workplaces were searching, and workplaces were searching all over for techno health workers, infrastructure challenges, and reorganization of students how, and how to complete the 2020 academic year. Today we are here thanks to technology-based tools that allow for virtual conferences. The next one is the current challenges. Here we can make an example of the pandemic and the vaccines. Pandemic with all its negative impact on the economy. We see the current challenges linked to the pandemic affecting all communities. Family meetings that make us play chess on the lockdown levels zero to four to COVID-19 pandemic and, uh, and need for us to keep daily watching what is on our screens on the television. South African universities are in a privileged position than some of our sister universi universities in the continent. Our universities can easily form collaborations with science councils, civil society groups, and private sector, allowing for advancement in their scientific projects or research. For example, the Wits University working together with Medical Research Council and other health-related research outfits to fight the pandemic and produce vaccines. University business schools working with the business forum to share ideas on helping small businesses in our country. Now we look at sustainability of universities and like everybody has been talking about funding, universities are expected to augment what they are receiving from government. Hence we talk about the first, second and third stream income in higher education. It's not news that the first stream income that is the grant from the state is shrinking by the year. And the second stream income, which is tuition and residence fees has its own challenges and control issues. 2015 and 2016 turned the tide for many universities as we experienced the fees must fall, roads must fall, Asina Mali students protests, these raised pertinent questions of financial responsibility because the financial sustainability of universities ultimately lies in their hands. 
It is also a case of inequality as even universities are on an equal footing. Many universities are working hard to remain financially sustainable. What we are facing is somewhat of a dual responsibility. Responsibility to educate young people in our society in an equal manner and a responsibility to remain financially viable in order to carry out the mandate. Efficient and effective strategies are being developed by some universities to stay afloat, especially student funding strategies. The Department of Higher Education and Training through NSFAS and NRF is doing its best to provide funding for both undergraduate and postgraduate students. But year after year, it becomes obvious the best is not good enough. So universities must find solutions. We move on to decolonization of universities. Here, the main issue is the curriculum, research and innovation. The 2015-2016 protests also brought about the subject and debate on decolonizing of university curricula. There were threats and tensions, proposals and possibilities as issues of curricular reform were being debated. And today we hear talks about COVID curricula, COVID pedagogies, and total decolonization of our minds, especially people of my age group. Decolonizing of university speaks to what responsibility universities they have towards the incorporation of African histories and stories into the current curricula. The responsibility to focus on research that is Africa focused, emphasizing indigenous knowledge systems as opposed to interests of the West. We look at um, national challenges. Here we are referring to inequalities, strikes and community needs. We see these every day as part of the mandate to stakeholders. Universities are expected to attend to these challenges in a sustainable, beneficial and technologically friendly manner. Again, taking into consideration the virtual or digital inequalities. Engagement, which is the main topic of our subject. Engagement with communities. Remember we said communities refer to industry, business, civil societies, local communities. Now service delivery strikes are the order of the day. Are there technologies that can be developed to assist municipalities quickly attend to the service delivery problems? Are uh, our universities or our research projects focused on real community projects or problems? How do we conduct these? Do we have industry and business representation at our university boards? For example, advisory boards in our faculties and schools. What about engagement with gender-based violence societies? Or, at our universities, are these really happening? Now we look at the issue, the, the challenge of students, especially looking at employability and skilling. Here we look at universities because they have the responsibility to provide appropriate skills and conducive environments. Most universities have centers of entrepreneurship and rapid incubators, some with the support of CEDA. Students' ideas attend to enterprising projects to create jobs and small businesses. Are we skilling them to be employers, to be employees or both? Now referring to skilling of our students, as you can see on the graph here, Business Tech had an article on online course provider. Coursera, who published its industry skills report for 2021, it was detailing the most in-demand skills across the world right now. According to Coursera, 
these covered skills in the business, technology, and data science domains. Technology skills that are useful as we face this pandemic. It refers to digitalization at an accelerated pace that is digital information, including broadband growth in a short period to embrace remote work. It says 149 million new jobs are needed to maintain this transformation. Jobs in the cloud computing, cybersecurity, data analysis, and software development. However, it also stated in the report that workers will need a combination of technology skills, business enablers, and human skills to be most effective in a digital economy. Now, when we look back at what we discussed earlier, these examples are but a few of many challenges that require reimagining, not only in universities, but through universities. Discussions on virtual classes and virtual offices are far from ending as we consider mental health of staff, of students, and communities due to these challenges or needs. Now, when we look at engagement in the context of a transformative university, what, how, why, and when should universities transform? We should remember that the October 2010, 2015 National Higher Education Transformation Summit and the 2019 USAF conference all respond to above questions of what, how, why, and how. Not to delve into the details of South Africa's transformation, as a lot has already been written on South Africa's history. Transformation of older universities established pre-1994. This subject is also well covered in academic literature, conferences, and summit reports. In 2016, Gumede, that is Professor Vusi Gumede, wrote at length on why transformation was necessary in the higher education sector. He refers to African history, creativity, critical thinking, all of which were distorted by colonialism. He exposes a system, a systemic and psychological warfare more pronounced in education and curricula. Again, in 2020, Umeda expounds on the discussion by analyzing and looking at the challenges and prospects of the transformation of higher education institutions during President Tabombeki's era, where 36 universities were reduced to 21 universities in 2002. The explanation to this move, according to Chetty 2010, as quoted by Gumete, is that the reduction was a process attempting to bridge the gap between racial and territory-based higher education institutions, and to make these institutions accessible, inclusive, and meet certain standards of equity. Whether this was achieved effectively is still a question we are deliberating even today. All universities have a mandate to transform themselves, as well as the community environment or societies where they are based or affiliated with. Newer universities established in the post-apartheid era are perhaps better placed in addressing issues of transformation than older institutions. These universities should ideally embody all the ideals and aspirations of an inclusive, non-racial, non-sexist, transformed, and democratic society as part of a transformative mandate. It is the responsibility of new universities to embrace transformation in a way that fosters bigger engagement within society and globally. It can be argued that it should be easier for new universities to help transform and correct the telling of African stories and history. I have two examples that come to mind in terms of 
transformation and being effective in a community. The University of Mpumalanga was established in 2013. It is a hub of transformation within the province of Mpumalanga and students of University of Mpumalanga. The university's strategic plan 2015-2022 puts into context the location of the university and its related opportunities and challenges. It is responsive to the Mpumalanga political, socio-economic, geographical, and historical context, which is biodiversity enterprises involved in nature conservation, which also involves wildlife management, agriculture, forestry, tourism and hospitality, heritage and culture, mining and further education. This is Mpumalanga province. Therefore, the University of Mpumalanga is engaging with these issues to better the Mpumalanga communities. My second example is the Northwest University Faculty of Arts, which received a three-star rating. Yes, you don't want to hear about rating, but I'll mention it here. This university received a three-star rating for its contribution to sustainable development through research, training, and active relevant community engagement activities provincially, nationally, and regionally. Now, Professor Hart at the University of Western Cape recently shared key objectives of community engagement, where she talks about community development or engagement values. She describes these six values to be number one, community empowerment. Number two, working and learning together. Number three, sustainable communities. Four, equity and anti-discrimination. Five, social justice. And six, collective action. And number six is collective action. And I found this to be what should really drive and motivate universities to actively engage with communities. These values are very, very important if we consider engagement as universities. On the basis of all that has been said, we realize that transformation that begins at universities creates a ripple effect in that lives of people get transformed and they in turn transform society. Why ripple effect? Universities engaging with all stakeholders, including their immediate community, develop and, trans and transfer knowledge. Now from knowledge transfer comes the introduction of new approaches, new tools, new concepts to help both the stakeholders and the institution. What we then see is a cycle of innovation from higher education institutions to the communities, to the relevant sectors and vice versa. This means that all involved parties benefit from the co-creation and ultimately transform. Now you consider how universities have transformed due to COVID-19. They all have to transform because they had to respond to the need that education must carry on despite the pandemic. Because every institution has a mandate of further education as per section 29 of the South African constitution and the national development plan. South Africa is one of the highest rates of public investment in education in the world. We refer to 7% of GDP and about 20% of total state expenditure. The government is, has been spending more on education than any other sector. You may correct me, I don't know how much it's spending on the health sector after the COVID-19, but definitely on education, government spends a lot. The National Development Plan aims to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by 2030. Chapter nine, 
is on improving the quality of education and training, as well as innovation. Universities also have to be responsive and responsible to execute regional and international agreements. The African Agenda 2063, its second goal being well-educated citizens and skills revolution underpinned by science, technology, and innovation so that we have a prosperous and united Africa. Now, this slide is taken from Professor Hart's presentation on cross-sectoral engaged partnerships. It shows that national, continental, and global challenges are similar and need to be tackled jointly. Sustainable development goals. The first goal covers poverty. The fourth one, quality education. The ninth one, industry innovation and infrastructure. The 10th one, reduced inequalities. Number 11 is on sustainable cities and communities. 16 refers to peace, justice, and strong institutions. All these are also the focus of the continent and some of our country, South Africa. The question is, how are we engaged on these as South African universities? How are we effectively contributing towards these goals? Are we engaged in research that solves the challenges for the betterment of our societies, our continent, and the globe? We should remember what Silos and May in 2014 reminded us of. He said, they said, it is important to better understand the role that research plays in people's efforts to solve environmental, social, and economic justice issues and to strive for social change. Research is not just research. Research must be directed to something that is going to better our economies. Therefore, our research must be transformative and relevant to the national and international goals. I would therefore like to conclude by indicating that reimagining does not mean overhaul, but bettering the system to improve communities, livelihoods, environments, students as we described them. We also we need to approach reimagining university engagement in a responsive, responsible, and transformative manner and hope to achieve higher education institutions that are positive, evolving tools. Different needs continue to arise, some without warning, and universities have to embrace them. Universities continue to reinvent themselves in order to transform communities. This is a cycle where needs arise, universities respond responsibly, and transformation takes place. Therefore, we can proudly say that reimagining is a process. It's not an event. It's very important. It's a process. It's not an event. And therefore, with this, I would like to say thank you, Nagode, Thank you, Roli Bua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lukela Olarunju. And you were just on point uh, in terms of your timing. Um, thank you for the wide ranging uh, and thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I, I particularly liked your emphasis on the notion of communities rather than just community and just the community next door. But I also think you emphasize the importance of the community next door um, and that growing from that and that ripple effect um, and that you spoke about. Um, you asked really important questions, I think, in relation to responsiveness, to what, a responsiveness to whom, uh, and transformation in what ways. But even more importantly, I think you linked why to all of those questions, which uh, uh, really uh, gave us food for thought. So, so uh, what clearly came through is that engagement uh, includes responsiveness. 
uh, to community needs, uh, community challenges, uh, community conditions through the Knowledge Project, uh, which is about learning and teaching and research and innovation. Uh, thanks very much, Prof. Our third speaker this morning is uh, Professor Salim Vali. Uh, Professor Vali is the director for the Center for Education Rights and Transformation uh, at the University of Johannesburg. And he also occupies the DHET NRF Sarchi Chair in Community Adult and Workers Education. Prof Vali is uh, passionate about linking uh, academic scholarship with societal concerns, a community participation uh, and social solidarity, uh, and draws on an extensive history of, of social activism uh, and academic, academic engagement in order to uh, take forward uh, this uh, interest and passion. I'm sure that we'll benefit from a very interesting take on the theme by Professor Vali. Uh, Professor Vali, over to you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Green, and uh, really thank you to the organizers, um, Youssef, uh, CHE, uh, for providing the space for us to collectively and critically reflect on the notion um, of the engaged uh, university. I just want to share that. Do you see it? It's coming up, Prof. Okay, thank you. It, it's there now. Thanks. Um, I think it's really uh, essential that this discussion is taking place uh, in this period. Um, and the context and challenges of the pandemic has, as the conference concept document outlines, fundamentally compelled us to consider, reconsider uh, foundational questions regarding what our universities are as social institutions and who they are meant to serve. Um, I just want to say, Chair, if you allow me um, to write at the outset, commiserate with all who have lost their colleagues and family members. It's been a dreadful period uh, for many of us. Um, and it is difficult uh, to find solace for our collective and irreplaceable losses. Uh, but this platform allows us to take stock really of, our, of the urgency of the task. Uh, in the words of Arandati Roy, in the midst of this terrible despair, referring to the pandemic, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Um, at a rudi rudimental but important level, many of our com colleagues around the world are critically grappling with how the pandemic offers us the opportunity to rethink not only new digital, online and pedagogical possibilities, but more importantly, the purpose of higher education and how a renewed vision of education might be harnessed to develop more democratic and just society. Uh, this reimagination, if you like, uh, is what I understand what I understand informs the eight sub-themes from which Youssef hopes to formulate an action plan. For me, there are four major areas uh, that we need to discuss before arriving uh, at an adequate action plan. There are many assumptions we need to question. The first issue is to understand the long debate we've had in our country about the Academy's social responsibility, community engagement, and accountability 
to various constituencies beyond the university's gates. Secondly, an appreciation of the overarching political economy of higher education. And thirdly, uh, the imperative to rethink scholarship uh, in order to engage community. And finally, um, uh, concepts, uh, the portmanteau concepts of community and engagement need, uh, needs to be um, unpacked. So the first area around the long-standing debates. Uh, firstly, Professor Sibongil Mutwa usefully and indeed compellingly referred to Professor Chris Brink's preference for the critical and difficult framing question, what are we good for, as opposed to the more customary and promotional response by a number of university leaderships, what are we good at? These are not new questions, I have to say. Uh, just a few examples, quick examples will suffice. As early as 1999, the late George Subotsky, working with Harold Wolpe, Salim Badat, and others at uh, UWC's EPU, posed variations on the question. In an article entitled Bef Beyond the Entrepreneurial University, the potential role of South Africa's historically disadvantaged institutions in reconstruction and development. Subotsky argued that there are two tendencies affecting higher education. On the one hand, universities and colleges are under pressure to become more market oriented and to respond to rapid changes in information technology and knowledge production. And on the other hand, there is a growing concern that they should work for the benefit of society, promoting social equity and responding to community needs. Whether we can do both at the same time is up for debate. Neville Alexander too, in a commentary in what seems like another era during the debate relating to academic freedom and institutional autonomy, between John Higgins, Roger Southwell, and Andre Dutoy. Um, even at that time, forcefully argued that the university is accountable not only to the collegium, but also the various constituencies beyond the wall. To quote, the moat that secured the university from outside interference has been filled up by capitalist development. And the inmates have to soil their feet by venturing outside beyond their comfort zones in order to address the issues of immediate and ongoing concerns to people out there. I doubt that there are many, he said, who would not agree with this and find it most welcoming. However, the answer to the question of who the constituencies are and what power they have to influence what goes on inside uh, uh, the walls is crucial. The most inarticulate expression is the reason for the turmoil and angst that has gripped university establishment all over the world, not just South Africa. Uh, and Alexander goes on to explain that this is not a sim simple matter of effective pedagogy, but it involves the, ve the very character of the system of reproduction. That is, whether it is meant to replicate generation after generation, the same inequities, or whether it is calculated to flatten these out. In the final analysis, the question is whether the definition and the consolidation of a democratic society, that is one in which all citizens have not only equal rights uh, on paper, our constitution, but the equal opportunity of ex exercising these rights. Put differently, the university has to re-examine its essential character, not in order to generate some popular notions, people's university,
but in order to use its resources and privileges, as uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Lukiele says, for the empowerment of the urban and rural poor. Which allows me, uh, and what uh, Alexander said, allows me to segue to a very critical area uh, which we need to debate, and that is the political economy of higher education. Uh, what is the current landscape of uh, this political economy? Uh, and it's true, uh, uh, with some reason, some universities portray themselves, uh, and, and many in those universities, of course, genuinely are very genuinely keen uh, uh, to be seen as community engaged and really are committed to social equity uh, and social justice. Uh, but this is sometimes critiqued as an exercise in corporate branding strategy, very much like what banks and other companies do consistent with market competition, rather than reflecting actual practice and institutional uh, change. And I have to pose the question, can a corporate model university foster an understanding of transformation, of decolonization as well, and the wide, wide range of socioeconomic problems in South African society? What is the trend in many countries and can we avert this trend? Necessary, I argue, to positively play a systemic role uh, concerning society's fractures, its discordance, uh, exclusivity, inequalities and discrimination explicitly uh, mentioned in the sub themes that Yusuf has provided to us. Bob Jessup argues that there is an increasing trend towards academic capitalism uh, and profit-oriented uh, entrepreneurial practices in the field of education and research. This occurs as universities in different ways and subject to greater or lesser financial, um, administrative and ideological pressures act le less like centers of education and research, and more like businesses uh, that aim to maximize their revenues or advance the economic competitiveness of the spaces in which they operate. And this development has become more global thanks to intensifying competition among relevant institutions uh, uh, and between the wider economic and political spaces in which they are embedded. Uh, and in, in the light of annual deficits, of, of student debts, um, uh, student demands, it is understandable, understandable that we, uh, as we increasingly see universities pressured to pursue some of these activities, the third stream funding ventures, and, and start beginning to model themselves on businesses. And no doubt, uh, most universities are under severe financial pressure uh, and strain, as we all know. But really, can we work together instead of comp competing with each other, with students, staff, and communities, in a united front to find ways to confront uh, budgetary uh, austerity? Uh, have we really squandered the possibilities that existed on a mass scale during the fees must fall um, and decolonization uh, moments? Now, slaughter and roads address the trend whereby academic staff are channeled into entrepreneurial ventures as part of the university's income generating effort. Uh, the relevance of academic work is then linked to productivity as measured by rating and, and ranking scales that uh, there's a lively discussion in the chat about. Uh, and our late 
professor, a colleague, Professor Michael Cross, has done uh, a lot of work about the dangers of these trends. The theory of academic capitalism aims to explain the integration of the university uh, into the global activity uh, and how a variety of state resources create new circuits of knowledge and link higher education institutions into the new knowledge economy. And this is, should not be the trajectory since it reflects the encroachment of the profit motive into the academy and represents uh, a shift from the public good knowledge learning regime to an academic capitalist knowledge learning regime. The idea of higher education then as a public good is surrendered to the logic of the bottom line and antithetical to the vision of an engaged university, I argue. Uh, both research and critically uh, pedagogy, argue Richard Hall and Kate Bowles, are now governed by a language rooted in productivity and organizational development. Universities deliver return on investment through brand, portfolio, and product. And this happens in some universities more than others. Uh, and with other large corporations, they have refocused their strategic planning. I argue that this development weakens, instrumentalizes and commodifies community links and resources for research to advance the ideals of critical citizenship and democracy in favor of corporate uh, interests. We can't gloss over it, we can't dismiss it, and I don't mention these things in a cynical way, but precisely because I think those sub-themes are laudable and worth pursuing, but in order for us to achieve them, we have to address these issues. Subjects and disciplines today that have a purchase in the marketplace are valued more highly, uh, for instance, and research publications are in the hands of a handful of wealthy transnational corporations. There are many other examples of the corporatization of university. What happens is that solidarity and learning that addresses the self to public life uh, and social responsibility to robust public participation and democratic citizenship um, is marginalized. Now, there are also entrepreneurial forms of techno utopianism, of robotics, of, of blind faith in technology and evangelizing in educational technology. And these are often uncritically embraced by some university administrations um, as uh, the panacea, as the answer. Please don't misunderstand me. I don't think uh, anybody is arguing that technology doesn't have a role to play, but we really need to look at that uh, uh, critically and see how it can support our quest instead of reproducing even more uh, inequalities. Uh, without addressing social relations in our society. Also, I think, uh, also thinking that big business is the savior um, has shown over the past three decades to be an utter failure. Uh, this quest for economic growth uh, has not delivered uh, the goods as far as unemployment and equity is concerned. And we really need to think creatively about livelihoods instead of thinking that economic growth by itself will deliver uh, jobs. And we need to critically think about skills as well. Quite often there are skills, but there are no jobs. Um, and we need to think about livelihoods beyond aligning ourselves just with business. 
business? What about social housing? What about public transport, food sovereignty, farming projects, environmental rehabilitation, sustainable energy, universal health, human rights centered work, and many other programs and vocations that doesn't just speak to the market and to entrepreneurial competition. Gary McAuliffe, uh, uh, in the face of the pandemic, strikes a hopeful note. He says, it seems likely too that there will be a nostalgic yearning for a golden age when diseases seem to be largely eradicated and there appear to be no social limits on growth. Um, and so he says a renewed understanding of world history is of paramount importance to counter this. We're gonna have many more zoonatic uh, uh, illnesses. And this is also a function of our headlong pursuit of economic growth and of climate uh, catastrophe. Um, McClough argues that it may be that neoliberalism, the dominant social and economic influence of the past generation will now face its greatest test. How can a free market contend with the forces set loose by a pandemic that respects no private interest? It may be, may indeed be that environmental concerns living within the resource of the planet and supporting public health can take center stage, even to help displace the strongest of current orthodoxies. If so, the fresh thinking of the new abnormal may indeed have a chance of challenging the Enshan regime. And I need to speak to the question of the Engage University and how it relates to the imperative of really rethinking uh, scholarship if we want to genuinely uh, uh, engage. Um, as we all know, prior to 1994 and during the transition, there was a really strong tradition of university academics, postgraduate students working closely with civil society uh, and grassroots organizations in a whole range of areas. Many of them were neglected and often their work was disregarded or dismissed as mere activism or advocacy and not scholarly. Um, and for the past three decades, we've certainly seen pockets of engaged scholars throughout the country. Professor Lukele has mentioned some examples. I have a whole series of examples from a number of universities, uh, which I won't uh, talk about right now. The point is that we need to think of how the university might properly support such socially responsive scholarship, augmenting the value of academic um, uh, and publishable uh, work in accredited journals more discussion and, and complex uh, and nuanced criteria are really required to include these various forms of scholarly engagement. Enver Motala makes the point that we should strive to search collectively for more encompassing approaches to scholarship, which includes critical uh, scholarship beyond the limits of academic writing and teaching knowledge uh, and integration. He provides several key areas of concern around scholarship and community, which I've quickly summarized as follows. Firstly, present conceptions of engagement are often premised largely on the linear transmission of preconceived ideas from academics two communities, leaving little room for critical evaluation of such knowledge uh, uh, about the forms of academic validation 
of their scholarship based largely on accredited writing in scholarly academic uh, journals. Uh, and I think he's arguing here that we need a Frarian approach. We need uh, a dialogical way of uh, communicating with uh, a community. Secondly, approaches uh, to engagement are often silent about predominant interests in the engage activities of universities directed quite often at supporting big business and to a lesser extent of the government uh, and less regard paid to the knowledge developed in communities themselves and the practices of the many critically engaged academics that do exist. The dominance uh, of uh, business-led orientations often lead to particular interpretations of community engagement. The third point is that the obligation to pursue uh, the university's public good mandate is often negated by the reach of powerful interests in shaping the work of academic institutions. The subordination of the public uses of knowledge and its production to the, direct, uh, 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 to the direct interest of particular companies for profit, including the privatization of intellectual property uh, produced largely. Uh, it has, must be emphasized through the collaboration uh, of public uh, good research. And an immediate example comes to mind, uh, the devastating consequences of the failure to lift the, uh, or, or the waiver on the patent of vaccines at the behest of pharmaceutical companies, giving rise to what many call vaccine apartheid. Fourthly, there is, a, the, there is no strong and systemic obligation uh, on the one hand which requires universities to respond to what is often touted as a core mandate uh, we've heard that phrase to use their intellectual and other resources to support the process of learning in especially those communities that are historically and socially marginalized but also many academics are unaware and sometimes even dismissive, um, I have to say frankly, of the considerable amount of non-formal uh, and unaccredited educational research and practice uh, taking place in such communities. So many examples at engagement, so-called, are often characterized by paternalism and condescension that passes for knowledge co-construction. We need to examine how this orientation affects our engagement. Um, now, social movements have emerged in our country and many countries. Uh, they are engaged in issues of the poor and marginalized, uh, around issues of income inequality, poverty, hunger levels, egregious levels of unemployment, uh, of racism, of, of gender violence, and really a raft of psychosocial issues, including drug abuse, psychological trauma, uh, illnesses, and, and other uh, pathologies. And we need to speak to the work of these social movements, which also produce extremely important and valuable uh, knowledge. And it is in this context that questions of uh, how academic work might be understood through the process of engagement with these uh, movements and the communities that they represent, even if unevenly, must be debated and discussed. Communities of the marginalized uh, 
can provide a constructive base for social action towards the goal of a just society. And academics who set out either explicitly or by implication of their research and studies, teaching, and pedagogical methods uh, to pursue the agenda of justice cannot really uh, possibly avoid the issues that arise from these social movements and the communities. For our purposes, the social movements and organizational forms that arise from the collective life and struggles of communities are intrinsic, not only to the mobilization of community for social, political and cultural purposes, but also as expressions of the modalities of learning and knowledge development that takes place daily in them. And this happens in mostly unseen and academically unrecognized ways, even though such learning is the lifeblood of the forms of uh, resistance, solidarity, and fortitude, essential to the survival of many communities. Our late uh, colleague- has Apologies, Prof. Prof. Ali. Yes. Um, can we wrap up in one minute, just so that we can be approaching sure. the end of the session? Right. Um, I think that there are many issues we need to talk about in terms of how we understand community. Who is the community? What are the different in, uh, uh, interests in these communities? And I think we need to uh, look at reimagining disciplines to speak to uh, the aims that the sub uh, themes provide us. And even before, and I'm concluding in this way, that even before uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, the sociologist uh, Cornell uh, dealt with some of the issues we are grappling with in her book, The Good Universities, what can universities actually do and why it's time for radical change. And while she doesn't uh, offer a blueprint, she provides ideas which help us reimagine uh, universities and visages a more democratic, engaged, truthful, creative, and sustainable institution where the good university is cooperative rather than competitive, where there is a friendly environment to work in, uh, where people share facilities instead of fearing that they will lose status, privileges, and money, and where Mikhailinikos Zimbailis who writes about Cornell's notion of curricular justice, uh, argues that we have to consider specifically how it is entangled with relational justice and creates spaces in higher education that nurtures the values of relationships, care, compassion, respect, and solidarity, vital not only in these times, but essential if we want to in intend to move towards a responsive, responsible and transformative university. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you very much, Prof. Vali. And I think really a rich uh, uh, input um, uh, uh, that uh, touches on many issues. Um, and what stood out for me was this notion that we are in a, a re-moment, you know, re-imagine, uh, rethink, uh, re-examine, a reposition, uh, and we are in this moment as a result of um, a number of uh, uh, issues that have brought, it, brought us to this place, uh, and we should really be taking advantage of it um, and not uh, kind of defaulting uh, back to uh, positions that we've held in the past. The idea that the polit political economy of higher education uh, is a potent force that is uh, driving uh, particular uh, values and kinds of practice. Um, and academic capitalism, um, kind of a, a dominant modality that kind of defines how we even think about notions of engagement. Uh, th thank you very much for that. We are really at the last uh, five minutes of the session um, and we are not able to go on to uh, any extra time given the, the tight program uh, and the scheduling on an online platform. I'm just gonna ask um, the, the, uh, the one question um, that relates to 
uh, the input uh, around the, the, the standards setting, the idea that uh, the rankings. Um, and maybe to ask a Prof, a Prof Musia this question quickly, if you can, and then maybe to off, ask other questions if I can after that. So, so why are we so motivated by competition, uh, position and status uh, as compared to service? Uh, and how do we change this? Does this relate to the political economy uh, and to the notion of uh, academic capitalism? Uh, and maybe uh, Prof Musia can respond uh, and then the other colleagues uh, as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Green. I think uh, we, we need uh, a deep reflection, really, uh, about competition and rankings. Look, rankings matter. We know that. It's not a big deal. But the fact of the matter is, in a society as ours, is it not possible for us to, to engage in such a manner that uh, we can embrace good practice, but also lift others to be able to, to reach what, what others have reached? instead of being competitive. And you find a lot, and we've been talking about it for decades in this sector, that uh, I, I personally think we can do much better uh, by reaching out and, and helping one another to be able to, to become a responsive society to the many challenges that we have in this country. Th th thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof Wally, any take on that? This idea of a competition, the kind of tendency towards um, uh, affinity with rankings um, and what's kind of driving that and how it competes with the notion of service. No, absolutely. And there's so much written about it. We really don't have the time, but I'm very glad that this issue has been raised. I mean, for me, I think the key issue is how does the ratings and ranking regime undermine exactly what we're trying to do? Um, um, you know, to what extent are the issues around uh, decolonization uh, ranked? Are they equally ranked with business pursuits? Uh, these are businesses that rank. Uh, it's big money. Uh, they also instill patronage in our institutions. Uh, there are some universities that have medical schools that have uh, uh, people who belong to Goldman Sachs and others and who increase their rankings as a result of that. Uh, many of our universities that are in the rural areas, etc., are at a disadvantage and feel belittled, humiliated, actually. And, and I really think this is not the way to go. There are some positive aspects to it, but I think that there are so many negative issues I haven't even begun to talk about these, but I really recommend that people read the work of many of our colleagues who have spent a lot of time debating this in a considered way, like, as I mentioned, the late uh, Professor Michael Cross. Th thanks very much, Prof. Avali. Uh, and Prof. Lukela Olo Olorunju, last words from you. A closing thoughts are on this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Green. Well, we all know that competition is healthy, but I wish in our own cases, we would compete on how we help each other instead of competing on how we are connected to such and such a big university. We are doing research with such and such a big university. We are doing that with Europe, with America. What are we doing with African universities? What are we doing with our own universities within South Africa? As we all know that we are on an equal footing. That for me, that would be what I would, uh, I would say if we are rated on that, I think it would make more sense than being rated because uh, of other things. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Prof. Um, and then it just remains for me to say thank you very much to all our uh, presenters for the rich uh, uh, engagements. I think really a starting point for discussion. Uh, and that's what this conference is about, starting to feed the ideas into a national discussion that can take us forward. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank to all the delegates who participated uh, in the session.